This is session B2 of the MRI Together workshop. Um, the title of the session is Ensuring Reproducibility, Phantoms and Preclinical Imaging. Um, I'm Shahan Malik from King's College, and I'm just moderating the session along with um, my co-moderator, Peter Lally. Uh, there he is, from Imperial in London as well. And we have three speakers now um, in the first hour of the workshop, followed by a 15 minute break um, in the ATND platform, and then a 45 minute interactive session um, on digital reference objects for ASL with um, Aaron Oliver Taylor. Okay, so to get us started then, we have uh, Sebastian Weingertner uh, talking about the metrics of quantitative evaluation for phantom studies. Uh, please take it away, Sebastian. Thank you very much, Shehan, for the for a nice introduction. It's a pleasure for me to, to give this presentation here today, and I don't have any conflict of interest to declare. So before talking to the, uh, you about um, how to measure the quality of our measurements, I want to start with a small story about what's a good measurement. In 16th century Europe, it has been proposed to measure a length by taking the first 16 people that step out of a church, aligning their left foot, and taking the combined length of these 16 feet and define it as a rod. But intuitively, that sounds like a very poor measurement, right? If we go on a different Sunday or to a different church or a different venue altogether, we are likely to get different results all the time. What is worse, if we change the experimental conditions, for example, we take the same experiment to the Netherlands where everyone is super tall, we get a different result altogether. So what we want to find out in the next 15 minutes or so of the talk is how bad is this measurement really and how can we quantify this? To start with this, let's take a look into what actually is a measurement. We can find this out in the meteorology community, the sciences of measurement. In their international vocabulary, measurement is being defined as the process of experimentally obtaining one or more quantity values that can reasonably attribute it to a quantity which is a property of a phenomenon body or substance to which a number can be assigned with respect to a reference. Now, this has three important aspects. Firstly, all measurements are quantitative to a certain regard. They are expect expressed in numbers. Um, we're trying to measure a property, uh, most often a physical property of the object under investigation, and it only makes sense to define a measurement with respect to a reference. Even what we know in MRI as a qualitative measurement would have a reference, therefore. So with this in mind, we can turn to the measurement errors. Um, the measurement error can easily be assessed or uh, thought of if we have a ground truth. Often it is thought of as the deviation of our measurement from the, the ground truth. And I'm sure you've all encountered the mean squared error as a metric to assess that. However, in metrology, it turns out that we prefer to use other to, uh, uh, metrics instead, namely variance and bias, or how it's called in the imaging biomarker uh, community, uh, preferably bias and precision. This is a very good decomposition of the measurement deviation, because firstly, we, we see that it fully characterizes the measurement uncertainty. This can easily be verified by the equation in the top right. Secondly, and more importantly, those two aspects have very different interpretation and very different practical implications. And that's illustrated on the left-hand side by this uh, figure, which is the, the oldest figure known to mankind about measurement error. In the bottom row, you see a measurement with high bias that exerts a tendency to deviate from the ground truth. While on the right-hand side, you see um, a measurement with low precision and therefore widely randomly scattered measurement points. These two metrics in to, um, uh, is what we are going to discuss more detail throughout the rest of the talk. But why do we find ourselves talking about this in the phantom study, in the phantom session? Well, it turns out that phantoms are one of the most useful tools to actually characterize our measurements. What are phantoms? They can be defined as such. Oh, well, no, that's the wrong kind of phantom. More like this, an inanimate object that is built to mimic different tissue properties. And we try to characterize our measurements with these. Why don't we just do this in humans? Well, phantoms are a lot cheaper 
easier to scan and more reproducible. They never gain weight, they're not in a bad mood, and they don't start moving around if they get bored in the scanner. And more importantly, their properties are very controllable during phantom reconstruction. On the other side, unfortunately, not everything can be well captured within a phantom, and therefore some phenomena are best left to be studied in vivo. And with this in mind, let's get into the mud and turn to the first metric, which is bias. How uh, bias can be defined as a metric that describes the systematic measurement error. That means our measurements may have a tendency to deviate from the ground truth or the reference. And this tendency is captured by biases. The tendency usually remains the same across replicates, and therefore this measurement error cannot be alleviated by averaging across measurements. Having said that, even though it may remain the same across replicates, it doesn't mean the bias is always constant. Biases are often the result of measurement of model inaccuracies or other confounding factors, and therefore may very well change with experimental conditions, acquisitions, or so forth. In order to measure a bias, we need to start from a ground truth. And that's a bit of a problem. As the metrology community defines, the ground truth is almost like a philosophical concept, because even if the ground truth is very well defined or very well present, as in the example of the reference kilogram in the right, it is often considered unknowable that because every attempt to measure the ground truth will be asso uh, associated with certain uncertainties. That's why we turn to reference methods instead. Reference methods are a lot more handleable. The reference methods attempt to ascertain the value of the ground truth by having substantially better performance, order of magnitudes mostly, than the measurement method in question. And that's both in terms of bias and precision. It's very important that these reference method uh, methods are independent from the method of uh, under investigation. For example, they should not share the same source data because any linkage between those two methods may lead to common confounding factors and therefore a gro a gross underestimation of the biases. Reference methods are often very lengthy or even invasive procedures and may not always be available in vivo or actually rarely are. And therefore, phantoms are our best guess to assess bias in many applications. Examples of measurement uh, uh, techniques that count as reference methods may include measurements during phantom constructions, the best available NMR methods, or also best available long scan time MRI methods. So having known our, um, our reference method, we can finally start to define our bias. Um, let's take this nice phantom object in the upper left. We have n observations, which in this case are different phantom wires. If we take a reference measurement, as well as a measurement with our method in each of the bytes, the overall bias can be defined as the average relative deviation of these two. And as always in metrology, remember to report the confidence intervals for this. And also, the bias may be actually dependent on the true value, and therefore it, is, it may be considered to, uh, to plot a bias profile which depicts the bias as a function of the true value as shown in the plot to the top right. A good phantom that can be used for the assessment of um, bias in a phantom study covers a whole range of expected values, both in healthy tissue as well in the pathology of interest. And also it attempts to vary the parameters of interest, mostly independently from confounders. As a general rule of thumb, we should aim for at least 10 equally spaced reference values in a phantom study of considering the bias. So the overall bias is a great metric, but there's more to bias than just this. Often it is very desirable to have linearity in the measurements. How can we assess that? Taking the same reference and me uh, measurements across um, observations, we can do this by fitting a cascade of higher order polynomials. For example, um, it's recommended to start with the third order polynomial by testing the leading coefficient for significant difference from zero. We can test for any significant symmetric point symmetric curvature. If no significant difference from zero is found, we can move on to a second order polynomial. Again, testing the statistical significance of the 
leading coefficient allows to uh, uh, test for any residual curvature. If again, no significant difference is found, the hypothesis of no curvature cannot be rejected and we can proceed with linear pro uh, processing. In this case, here is a very nice exemplary plot from um, a PDFF liver paper, mm -hmm. which reports all the important metrics related to linearity that we can assess after ascertaining our measurements are linearly related to the ground truth. These measurements include the offset, and so again, both of them reported the confidence intervals, as well as the coefficient of determination. Um, as a rule of thumb, a good slope, again, is in the range between 0.95 and 105, and a good coefficient of determination is, is supposed to be an R square um, above 0.9. So you may wonder if we know our bias, for example, in the linear case, why don't we just go ahead and correct for this? Well, it turns out that's not a really good idea. Plus, as I mentioned before, the bias often arises from uncorrected confounding factors or model inaccuracies, and therefore may very well and very likely vary with different experimental conditions, such as the acquisition parameters or different patients and different settings. Therefore, it's very rarely reproducible. In the end, um, uh, attempting calibration-based corrections um, will more likely than not trade off reproducibility against bias. And this may not be worth the while, as small biases can actually be very well tolerated in a clinical setting. For example, constructing confidence intervals under a no-bias assumption includes um, or accounts for fixed biases that are very small compared to the relative, uh, relative to the position anyways. Only large biases are reasons to worry about reproducibility or the trueness to the definition of the physical property. What is more and somewhat counterintuitive, bias can actually help us with clinical sensitivity in rare cases. If the confounding factors that lead to bias are sensitive to the pathological alteration as well and happen to alterate our measurement in the same direction as the pathology, then the effect size may be inflated and leads to increased clinical sensitivity. Although this is to be taken with a grain of salt because reproducibility may still be at stake. Let's turn to the second metric, which is precision. And this one we can define as a closeness of agreement between measurement quantity values obtained by means of replicate measurements of the same object with specified conditions. So this captures the random error measurement error and therefore can be alleviated by averaging across multiple measurements, unlike the bias. The, the random measurement errors may be constituted and comprised by a variety of sources of variability and eventually including more or fewer of these sources leads to different scales of precision. Again, turning to our phantom, we can define our precision based on a set of standard deviations. When taking a number of measurements, um, uh, replicate measurements in each of the different phantom bytes, our n observations with m measurements, we get a different standard deviation for each phantom byte. The geometric mean across all these standard deviations can then be defined as the within subject standard deviation, a good overall measurement for the um, precision. Similarly, we can proceed with the same definitions based on the coefficient of variability, which describes the standard deviation relative to the average value. Again, always report these values with a confidence interval, and it may still be dependent on the true value. Therefore, a precision profile depicting the precision as a function of the true value um, may be considered. You may wonder why we need to replicate measurements in the first place. What if we put a lot of effort into designing a very homogeneous phantom object? Can't we just use the spatial distribution of our um, measured values as a, as a uh, marker for our precision. Well, that's again not a very good idea because spatial information is often used in the reconstruction and therefore may compromise the independence between different measurement locations within the same phantom object. And even if this is not the case, a lot of system parameters may be varying in the background without being immediately apparent from the measurement. For example, this includes 
the B1 plus field or the B0 in homogeneity. Um, so it's very important how we design our replicate measurements. And depending, depending on the definition or on the experiments that we do to obtain replicate measurements, we usually group precision in either repeatability or reproducibility. Repeatability is measurements of the same subject or object over a short period of time under the exact same conditions. That means you sit at the scanner and uh, start the same measurement uh, over and over again. This, the remaining variability will be labeled as repeatability. If you change anything in between, we move to reproducibility. And many things can change. We can move between field strength, different scanners, different pulse sequences or parameters, or even just induce long delays between the acquisitions. Repeatability is often assessed in phantom measurements, but can also be assessed in vivo as no and ground truth value needs to be known for that. Reproducibility is often more costly to assess because of multiple sites of vendors and involved, and therefore preferably is so, uh, assessed in vivo directly, but also large phantom reproducibility studies have been performed. With these large reproducibility studies, either in vivo or in phantom, a cascade of uh, complexity can be, uh, uh, can be proposed, starting from a simple single center study all the way to a multi-center, multi-vendor endeavor. These are usually with increasing complexity, leading to a larger level of variability among the measurements. Um, the experiments leading to these results are costly and time extensive. So it's often recommended to perform the technical validation on across multiple scales in parallel. As a rule of thumb, a good reproducibility study comprises more than 35 subjects with at least two replicate measurements. So this may be hard to obtain in a single study. It is often common practice to pool across multiple studies here. Overall, both repeatability and, and reproducibility, both precision markers are very important for clinical use because they directly drive the minimal detectable change, which is the amount of change in the measurement induced by a pathological alteration can be assessed with a certain confidence with respect to a healthy reference range. The repeatability or reproducibility coefficient, as defined on the right-hand side, are very important markers here, and also drive the determination of the cohort size in clinical studies, and therefore of great practical value. To sum these up, I want to conclude with a few recommendations on how to do a good phantom study. Firstly, I urge you to clearly define what you attempt to measure. Think about how, you uh, how this measurement is related to other physical properties and how it can best be ascertained as a reference value. Throughout the entire process, perform rigorous validation at every step, repeatedly assessing the bias and the precision um, to ensure no step compromises your measurement qualities. Um, be very structured in your reporting and clearly tell the reader or the community what has been tested, what has been constant, and what has remained the same. In quantitative imaging, a focus may be put on reproducibility uh, rather than image quality. And further, keep in mind that phantom studies are not the end of the road, but a lot of tenacity and work is um, needed to bring it all the way across the translational gap to clinical. With this, I hope you've learned that measurement errors can well be decomposed in bias and precision, where bias describes the systematic error that includes fixed bias, bias profiles and linearity, and precision the random error that comprises repeatability and reproducibility. Finally, I want to point you to this resource that the talk was based on, produced by the Quantitative MR Study Group under the guidance of Diego Hernando, and may be a great resource for your future planning of PMR studies. I want to thank very much to my research group collaborators and sponsor for the help with this work. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much for that, Sebastian. It was very, uh, very clear and interesting talk. Um, are there any questions from the attendees? Maybe I can ask you uh, a quick one. So you, you talked about, I guess we're mainly talking about phantoms here, but you had one quick number that I noticed, which said that 
um, you know, for looking at reproducibility, you need a study with more than 35 participants. And, and that wasn't something that I've come across before. I was just wondering if um, you had any insight as to whether that number is really a fixed thing, how you would go about determining it for a specific uh, investigation that you were looking at. Yeah, so um, uh, many of the ranges and numbers that I gave provide a, uh, um, a rough rule of thumb estimate. The one with the 35 number is um, uh, based on a paper by Nancy Ovochowski uh, from, I think, three years ago. So you find the citation in the, um, in the study where she, where she found that relative um, to the precision confident or in, in confidence intervals, 35 would be a, a reasonable number for typical MRI measurements to ascertain um, the reproducibility to a certain amount of, uh, of certainty. Of course, though, this is a rule of thumb and um, in, in under different uh, conditions, um, it can be well justified to, to run studies with very different sizes. Okay. And actually, one more thing I just noticed, we had a question in the chat. So, um, uh, from Patrick Fuchs, the question is, what about calibration of phantoms during use? Do you think this is essential or are phantoms steady, essentially steady enough over their lifetime? Oh, it's, I think that's a very good point. Um, I think everyone who's ever tried to build a phantom uh, know that they are not, especially if uh, home build, their longevity may be very limited. So I, I completely agree, Patrick. It's an essential component to keep calibrating the phantom. So the reference methods, uh, may it be NMR measurements or other MRI methods, should repeatedly be performed. And there's also a number of steps you can take to ensure a good longevity of the phantoms during constructions. Uh, let it be molding agents or proper sealing of the phantoms, proper storage of the phantoms. These are definitely all considerations that help to improve the evaluation here. Thank you.